Hello and welcome to the Atlanta History Center's virtual author talk featuring Brian Washington discussing his novel Memorial with Arts ATL's Gail O'Neill. I'm Kate Whitman, Vice President of Author Programs for the Atlanta History Center, and I'm so happy that you're joining us this evening. Copies of Memorial, as well as Brian's story collection Lot, are available from our official book selling partner for this evening, Karis Books and More. Those links are in the chat box at the right of your screen. Um, if you have questions for Brian, please add them to the chat at the right of your screen and Gail will look out for those and um, incorporate those as we go. And now to introduce our guests. Brian Washington is a National Book Award 5 Under 35 honoree and winner of the Dylan Thomas Prize and the Ernest J. Gaines Award for Literary Excellence. His first book, The Story Collection Lot, was a finalist for the NBCC's John Leonard Prize the Penn Robert W. Bingham Prize, the Aspen Words Literary Prize, and the New York Public Library Young Lions Fiction Award. Lott was a New York Times notable book, one of Dwight Garner's top 10 books of the year, and on the best of the year's list for, from Time, NPR, Vanity Fair, BuzzFeed, and many more. He has written for The New Yorker, The New York Times, The New York Times Magazine, BuzzFeed, Vulture, The Paris Review, McSweeney's Quarterly, Tin House, One Story, Bon Appetit, GQ, and Catapult. He lives in Houston. Gail O'Neill is a writer for artsatl.org where she covers arts and culture here in Atlanta. She's the host and co-producer of Collective Knowledge, a weekly series of conversations with artists, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders, which can be viewed on YouTube, Facebook, and Faya Network. Thank you both for being here, and Gail, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Kate, for that introduction. And Brian, welcome. I know you have family in Atlanta. I'm sorry you can't be here with us and, and doing this in person. You're in Houston right now, right? I am, yes, okay. and thanks so much for having me. Gail. Oh, it's a pleasure. All right, why don't we start with you giving readers or our viewers, some of whom have not read the book yet, an overview of what Memorial is about. No spoilers. Okay, so trying to do it sans spoilers. It really depends on who I'm talking to, like the explanation that I give. Memorial is a love story, and I've been calling it a queer slacker dramedy. Like it's something that I said once, and it stuck, you know, 82 different people like looked up, so I've been repeating it. Uh, my editor has called it a rom-com with teeth, which is something that I also quite like, but I've come to think of it as a book about trying to be okay as a person individually and also as a person among other people. A young man and his partner are negotiating what feels like a crease in their relationship and one of their mothers comes to town to help them along with it. Talk to me about those creases. I've, I've read, read other um, essays in which you talk about creases within ourselves and, and between us and, and the outer world. What felt really important to me or what felt really interesting to me was that transitory period that you have when you are looking at a relationship, whether it is a romantic relationship, whether it's a familiar relationship, whether it's a platonic relationship or a platonic relationship that is in the throes of becoming a romantic relationship. And you approach that point where you feel that it's becoming something else, right? Like it's becoming a different form, whether that's looking at a father and viewing them as a person, right? Like when they no longer fit that sort of father archetype, like you see them as a person with hopes and dreams and fears and loves and things that they've lost and things that they found. Whether you have that moment of realization with parents, with siblings, whether you have it with a partner when perhaps both of you are changing and your needs defer and you have to make the decision as to whether or not you're going to be able to match their needs or what changes you'll make or whether it's with a platonic relationship that is perhaps changing into something that is closer to found family or something that is closer to a romantic partner. So really playing in that space that seems deeply undefinable and seems deeply elastic was really important to me, but it was also really interesting to me. It felt like a space that I could spend some time in for a novel. You know, one of the more poignant aspects of those creases that you talk about for me in reading the book was how characters like Benson, 
who is queer, who's HIV positive, who is trying to navigate this hookup culture, and he's a very sensitive person, has to do that without any guidance from his parents. Um, tell me about that, the divide between parents, like people who gave you life, who know you better than anyone, and yet don't know you at all in the most fundamental ways. Why was that, that interesting? Yeah. It, it's just the idea of context, having such a massive role in who someone becomes, not only who they are, but also how they view themselves and perhaps what they allow themselves to think that they can ultimately become or how they think that they can be allowed to change was really interesting to me. And a central question for me in the book was who someone or who a character ultimately becomes when they're no longer in a context, whether that's in a relationship, whether that's in a geographic point, whether that's in a family unit that is telling them who they are or telling them who they need to be. Right? Like who a character ultimately becomes when they have that agency and they have that elasticity and that flexibility to become the person that they perhaps need to become. So it was really important to me to have a novel in which many different things can be true at the same time, right? Like you could have a character like Mike, who is queer, who's Japanese American, who's the cis guy, who finds one of the closest iterations of home that he's ever been privy to in Houston's Third Ward, which is one of the country's oldest historically Black neighborhoods, and to think of himself as a product of that neighborhood, to be a product of that neighborhood. And I wanted a novel in which it was also true that a character like that son, who is Black, who is queer, who's the cis guy, who is Paz, finds one of the closest, if not the closest iteration of home that he's ever been privy to in this older Japanese woman, Mitsuko. So trying to give characters grace with one another and the grace to change felt really important to me. Mitsuko is described as acerbic in all the press releases I've read about Memorial. And when I read about her, Mitsuko is like a porcupine with her quills up at all times. And she expresses love how when she does. It's very subtle. Yes, largely through food and largely through comfort and also largely through honesty, which feels like a massive act of love, particularly for characters for whom transparency and honesty may not be something that they're privy to very often. Right? Like Mitsuko, who is ex mom, she arrives in Houston at the beginning of the novel after making a very, very rough go in that city the last time that she'd spent time there. So to have a character like her who takes a flight from Japan to Texas to see her son, who immediately tells her that he's leaving to go find his estranged father in Oslo, he doesn't know when he's going to be back, and also she will be staying with his maybe partner, seems as if though it could be a pretty disastrous scenario. And yet the first thing that she does is cook a meal for Ben, the young man that she's staying with and creates a place of comfort and creates a foundation that is comforting, right? And even keel for both of them. And that feels like a really significant thing to give someone, to show them that they can be comforted even if they don't quite no, or can't quite articulate that that's what they're looking for. Yeah. Your food essays for The New Yorker are some of my favorite of, of any writings about food. Um, I want to share one that you wrote about bread pudding, your homage to bread pudding. It starts out, any dessert really subsists on the strength of the anticipation that it provokes. I love that sentence. Doesn't matter if it's a McFlurry or a slice of flan or some tiramisu. The dishes are connected by the liminal space between idea and taste. The hope is that within a few bites, the dessert will transport you to a place much warmer, more familiar than where you began. And then you end that same essay. There's something to be said about the role of queer bakers. We often end up providing comfort to those who may not have given it to us. 
that thread runs through, that same DNA runs through Memorio. How long has the idea of food and comfort and food as an expression of love and caring been interesting to you as a writer or just as a human walking around in the world? You know, as a person spending time on earth, I think that it's been fun to me since I started cooking, like back in junior high. And I did not think of myself as like a cloaker, did not think of myself as someone who would be able to monetize it, right? Or even construct narrative out of it. But it was something that I could do that could give the folks around me comfort. And it seemed like an autonomous identity, but over time I started seeing it as one that was inextricable from just how I view narrative and how I view story. And for Memorial, you know, the novel took about three years to write, which is a long time to be doing any one thing in particular. But this question of how one gives comfort to those that they care for, right? And what this notion of care looked like was one that felt like a knot that could be entangled any number of ways without arriving at both ends of the question, you know? And because it was a question that did not seem like it had a definable answer, that made it inherently interesting to me, right? And the goal for me became not to answer the question of like, what does comfort look like? And what does comfort through food look like? And what does love and care through the act of cuisine look like so much as spending a little bit of time in that conversation and perhaps spending a little bit of time in the quieter moments of that conversation. So the characters cook for one another and they comfort one another and they give one another pleasure through this cuisine. And in that way, like cuisine and cooking doesn't feel terribly divorced from narrative to me in that when you begin like to cook a meal, there is an end point in mind, right? Like whether you're braising something, you know, over the course of however many hours, whether you're setting something to marinade for like a day or so, there's an end point and there is like a desired source of comfort, whether for yourself or for the folks around you. And that transaction and that journey is just really interesting. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't feel precious in the novel. It doesn't feel overwrought. It doesn't feel like an expression of ego. It just feels very real. By the same token, the way you write about workers, Ben has a job. uh, Ben works at a daycare center for very young children. And Mike is a chef in a Mexican restaurant. And work is really critical and, and central in the narrative. Work can tend to be overlooked in a lot of narratives. Why was it important to you to show where these guys work and and take us into the day day to day? I think because work itself is just so integral to how each of those characters, Ben, Mike, Mitsuko, Lydia, Omar, Eju, Kunihiko, like the ways in which they move through the world, it would have felt intellectually dishonest and it would have felt lacking if I hadn't spent time in the spaces that they operate in and so much of their days and so much of their lives you know I mean I feel like so much of contemporary American literary fiction operates as if the work were not a thing that needs to happen and perhaps because certain populations seem to overpopulate the majority of the expanses of contemporary American literary fiction but work is important to these characters and the ways in which they learn about themselves through work, contrast with the ways in which they learn about themselves when they're not at work. And each of these spaces felt like opportunities to show the reader more about who they were, the characters, and how these characters felt, and how these characters changed over time. So it matters a good deal that Ben works at an aftercare spot, and it matters a good deal that Mike is someone who works at a tech spot in Houston and then works at a bar when he's in Osaka. And both of these places served as communities in a sense, right? And both Ben and Mike find a sort of family in both of these spaces. And it felt really 
important to be able to play with that tension between the necessity of making a life somewhere, right? And the means that one has or does not have for any number of reasons, whether infrastructural, whether personal, whether it's because of racism, whether it's because of homophobia, their ability to conjure the means to live the way that they want to. Like Mitsuko, when she's in Houston for the very first time, like the question of work is one that has so much significance in her life because she's not able to get any for the longest time. And then once the context in which she's in changes and she's able to find this work and she's able to find work that works for her, she has agency all of a sudden and her character changes and her access changes and her experience changes. And I think that's true to some extent for each of the characters. So really playing with how the characters looked and changed in any number of these contexts felt really important to me. Mitsuko com comes from Japan to the U.S. and she winds up thriving in the work world, whereas Ben and Mike are really still figuring it out. You always get the sense that things can go wrong, and if they do, they're one paycheck away from being kicked out of their homes, losing their lease and so on. I know that place was very important to you. You live in Houston, and you wanted to make sure that when you rendered Houston, your friends would say they would get some pleasure out of it. They would enjoy it. Did you tell me about your research in Osaka as well? Because the book takes place in Osaka in a bar, much in a bar, and in Houston. So tell me the, I guess I'm curious about what non-locals might miss that people who know Houston and know Osaka can say, oh yeah, Brian, Brian nailed this. Uh, such a good question. Um, a lot of it comes down to the details, you know? I mean, I feel like, for me, at least, regardless of whether I'm running at a place that I've spent an excess of time in, the majority of my time in, or whether I'm writing about a place that I've been really privileged to spend pockets of time, significant pockets, but pockets nonetheless, there is an outsized role that research plays. For Osaka specifically, I've been really fortunate to get to spend a lot of time there for the past five years or so, once or twice a year. And those initial trips were largely just to visit friends and just to hang out and visit Sento and eat around and go to bars and have, you know, a nice calm time. But something that began to make itself apparent over the course of those trips was that there's a warmth that the city emanates and it's a singular warmth and it's a warmth that I've only ever felt that iteration of in Houston. Mm -hmm. And offhand, a sort of at first glance, Houston and Osaka couldn't be more different from one another. Right? But thinking through it and spending time there, similarities emerge, right? They're both cities with distinct food cultures. They're both cities whose residents are very prideful of where they're from. They're both cities with deeply singular identities within the larger context of the places in which they're located, whether it's Houston as you know, this deeply diverse, deeply vibrant city and space within Texas whose identity is not necessarily one that has a one-to-one -one correlation with that in the wider imagination or whether it's with Osaka that is for Japan, like a deeply diverse city in an international city in a city that is so warm in a region kansai or within a country japan that is largely homogenous as far as the population is concerned and there was i think that one moment in which that really cemented itself is like i think my second time in osaka like spending a long night out with friends and leaving a bar in the umeda district that 2 two thirty in the morning and walking into the street and hearing a really loud iteration of chopped and screwed music emanating from a nearby bar and thinking you know this is this is houston right this these places are not so different from one another so a number of those tiny realizations have to calcify themselves in order for me to make that larger connection and a lot of the research came down to talking to loads of folks to spending time 
in a lot of the spaces, if not all the spaces that each of the characters spends time in and reading incessantly about how the communities that the characters, whether in Houston or Osaka, operate and how they came to be and how they move and revolve around one another because it feels important to have the fact of the thing, but it also felt really important to have the emotion of the thing, right? Like how it would feel for Mike and Kunihiko to walk at 3 a.m. in a commercial plaza, right? To know that I felt like I had to do that like a number of times or for a character like Ben to drive from grocery store to grocery store with Mitsuko looking for this one particular dish in order to figure out what that emotional pocket could look and feel like on the page. It felt like something I would have to do any number of times, both by myself and with someone who also knew what I was looking for and also folks who perhaps didn't know what I was looking for to have a sense of what the feeling of moving around a city with so much sprawl and so much diversity could feel like for a newcomer or perhaps someone who wasn't so familiar with it. So a lot of street details, a lot of tiny observations perhaps would be quite loud to folks who are familiar with each of those cities, but it was just as important to me to write a novel in which one didn't necessarily have to be a local or to have even a peripheral knowledge of what makes those cities work to feel as if though they had spent time in those cities themselves. And what inspired the device of using photographs, the photographs that Mike sends home via text message to Ben in the book? I think there are maybe eight plates in the book, uh, photographs from Osaka. Yeah. Were those pictures you snapped? Yeah, they were all photos that I took. Um, I was really fortunate in that I pitched um, the idea to my editor, who was a genius, and she didn't just dunk on me. And then we pitched it to the design team, and they did not dunk on us. And it made sense to me in a novel that is so concerned with communication and the ways that communication can create connections, and also the ways in which communication, whether it's literal or whether it's figurative, can create a myriad of misconnections to find alternatives Mm -hmm. to how the characters connect with one another because I didn't want to write a novel in which it was a question of whether the characters wanted to connect or whether they wanted to show affection to one another. I wanted to write a story in which that implicit answer was yes. And so the question became how they did that. And when dialogue doesn't work between the characters, they turn to other means. They cook for one another or they share silence with one another or they text one another or they send one another photos. So really trying to have a sense of how Ben and Mike who text one another want the other to feel in a moment when they perhaps can't articulate what they themselves feel or what they want their partner to feel was a guiding light when it came to figuring out which photos went where and who said what and why they sent it. You have said that Nakim's beautiful illustration, illustration for the cover of Memorial was a revelation to you, taught you something about the novel that you hadn't seen. So what was your before perception of what, you, what you'd written and your after perception based on this exquisite rendering? I just felt so lucky to, you know, be <laughs> to her time and her art. And for me, the idea of what a memorial is shifted a bit because titling the novel that from the outset, I loved the word and I love the word because there is a significance that's attached to it and it's a significance that can change. But the flexibility of that significance really didn't render itself to me until I'd seen the image that now crafted and cared for and created because some folks see the cover and you know they see a plastic bag and a pair of chopsticks and other folks see the cover and they see a surrender flag they see a concession that's being made other folks see the cover and they see a flag generally pointing towards the elasticity of borders 
right? And the sameness of people from locale to locale. And that ability to see something, whether it's the image on the cover or whether it's the font on the cover, like the word memorial, and to be able to impart what a reader wants to impart made a massive difference for me when it came to thinking about the novel because the memorial can be a really mournful thing or mm -hmm. it can be something that you look back at fondly or it can be something that gives us great joy or it can be something that we cast from memory whenever we can because it's too powerful or too strong or too scary. But nonetheless, it's an important thing, a memorial in whatever capacity, whether it's a memorial for a period of several centuries, whether it's a memorial for a moment that took 20, 30 seconds, whether it's a handful of months, as is the case in this particular book, or whether it's a lifetime. So that expansiveness, mm -hmm. while simultaneously being deeply personal, was something that I just didn't see and I so appreciated Nas rendering. Uh, in order to really make that surface itself. Yeah, it was really thoughtful. All right, I see some comments in the chat room. Let me see if there are any questions here. I invite everyone watching to ask questions or make a comment. Stacy Dexter says, I love your writing style. What, I guess Stacy's a friend, what led you to become a writer? And speaking of work, did you feel supported in your journey into the arts as a vocation by family and friends? T.Y., what does T.Y. mean? Thank, oh, thank you. <laughs> I am constantly looking, going to Urban Dictionary to look up these, all these terms. That's a great question. Oh my question. gosh, no. No, that's my life as well. Like, just like, what, what does Urban Dictionary say? Um, yeah, thank you, Stacey, for your question. Um, for the latter part, I am not someone who came to writing very early, and I certainly didn't come to reading very early. But when... I did start writing in earnest. What was really helpful to me was the support of the folks that I got to study with and the folks that I got to spend time with. One was in the form of a professor, Matt Johnson, who now teaches in Oregon. He used to teach in Houston. One was in another professor named Joanna Lee, who lives in New Orleans. And the support of my friends was like deeply pivotal. And in a lot of ways, like Memorial specifically was a book that I wrote for myself, the sort of book that I wanted to see in the world and also for my friends. One that I wanted them to enjoy and one that I hoped would make them laugh, one that I hoped would make them feel things and to feel perhaps differently at the end of it. So having that support something as simple as someone just saying, hey, like, I quite like what you're doing. Like, can you keep going? Or, hey, like, this is an interesting tangent. Or, hey, this is an interesting question. In a lot of ways, like, Memorial would not have come to fruition if not for the handful of friends who convinced me that it was, like, a story worth telling or a story that they would have found interesting. So that was deeply, you know, pivotal. Tell me more about the professors, the two you mentioned in particular, Joanna and the other name I didn't get. I think it's so important to give teachers their props while they're oh, still gotcha. here. And they tend, we tend to think, well, they know how great they are, but how would they really? So give them their yeah. books. Yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Joanna Leek uh, teaches at the University of New Orleans. Um, she is faculty there. Um, she is someone who could not be more thoughtful as far as the grace that she gives the work people are trying to do and the people themselves and she's someone who constantly challenged and encouraged the folks that she worked with to you know explore the questions and to explore the interests that they had and to follow them wherever it may have ultimately led them and matt is someone who, I mean, I feel like there's any number of authors in this sort of younger cohort of black authors who, if you mentioned Matt Johnson, like they're sort of look up and they're like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Because he's just, he's someone who takes the time and is someone who is deeply gracious with 
the time that he gives folks, which feels and is a very rare thing um, and a very genuine thing. But, you know, he's someone who I took his first class because uh, it fit my schedule because I worked three jobs in undergrad and it was a course that fit my schedule. And he, you know, was just deeply kind and deeply thoughtful and deeply encouraging as far as the things that I thought I wanted to do even before I thought that I wanted to do those things. So it felt and feels like a gift to have got to spend time with those folks who have been privy to their kindness. And now you are a lecturer at Rice University. Do you find yourself channeling them, saying the one or two things that turned a key for you to your students? At Rice? Oh, one could, yeah, one could only hope to. <laughs> you know, I think, you know, you know like that, that'd be like a high bar and like try and clue. But I think that the, one of the biggest things that I try to take for, from them and, you know, to and with the students that like I'm really lucky to work with because they're so smart, they're so thoughtful, and they're so into, you know, what they're trying to do while also being open to the wider world of story and narrative. It's to just follow their interests and to follow the things that they think are important regardless of whether they seem immediately monetizable, regardless of what role that they think it may hold in the market. Because if they find value in it, if they find importance in it, then that is something and that is a tangible thing. And that is something that, you know, should be allowed to exist and to bloom and to go in the direction that they would mm -hmm. like it to. Mm -hmm. Your other role at Rice is that of scholar in residence for race, racial justice. And you've spoken a lot about the myth of a single narrative for a writer and how dangerous that is and how we have to avoid that trap. How has that level of awareness informed what you bring to the role of um, scholar in residence for racial justice? That's, that's a hell of a title and a responsibility, <laughs> Brian. It is, it is a big title, right? And, and I think that you know, even thinking about Memorial from the outset, what felt apparent to me and what was a challenge, at least in the beginning, is that I did not have direct comps for that book when it came to writing it, which is to say that there were no comparative narratives that I could say, this is a book that is like Memorial that has done X in the market when it came time to just show it to the world, my agent and I. And it is a challenging thing because it isn't as if the narratives like Memorial don't exist in the world. It isn't as if though they don't have value, you know? It just has not been monetized or perhaps it has not made its way into the larger American literary canon or contemporary American literary canon, whatever that is or whatever form that it takes. And I think that there's a way in which the marketplace and the notion of what belongs in the marketplace and the notion of what belongs in the contemporary American literary canon can calcify itself so that you only see narratives featuring marginalized characters that center on their marginalization, right, or center on their trauma or center on their status as minorities within the country in whatever capacity, whether it is due to ethnicity, whether it's due to sexuality, whether it's due to their financial status. And they're flattened. Their, they're flattened and their narratives that do not give them the benefit of the doubt doesn't give them that elasticity, that space, that room to be a composite whole person. And it's just not true. <laughs> you know, it's just not true. And I think it's been really, heartening to be writing in a cohort of folks that are just saying no, you know, and just saying that it is unacceptable, right? Because it is not a true thing and are telling the stories that they would like to sell. But simultaneously, like I'm a strong believer that a book like Memorial could not and would not exist if not for the work of folks who had themselves challenged what was allowed in the market, had themselves challenged what narratives were able to be told, had done that, right? Like had done that work. Like it's the, the phrase like bring a seat to the table is mildly infuriating to me because like these are folks who forced their way there, you know, like they created a way 
when so many reasons could have just said no, right? It's too much work, like no one will buy it. If it does become a book, you know, it's not going to be marketable. It's not going to exist in the canon. There's no role from it. And, you know, these are folks who, you know, prior to a book like Memorial existing simply said no, like that's not true right? because it isn't true. So it's just really heartening to get to write among a group of folks who are doing the things that they're trying to do and writing about their communities and writing about the communities that they care about, treating them like people, you know? Yeah. Talk about the joy of just making things up as a writer. I mean, that is the big thing, you know? I mean, I think that there's a way in which one could look at the things that occur on the back end of publication or the back end of a novel's being release and point to that as being the point of the thing but it very much isn't you know I mean until you know March or April like I was emailing my editor that nine or ten people would be into memorial you know like <laughs> nine or ten people would you know take the time with this very particular novel about these very particular folks navigating their very particular circumstances and that was a sentiment that I was very okay with because it feels like a real gift to get to spend any amount of time thinking through concerns that are important to you, right? Structural concerns, thematic concerns through being able to create a world on the page just feels like a gift, you know, to get to do that. Right? And I don't think that it's one that solely exists like in the hands of writers you know like there's so many people in my life that are storytellers right whether they work at like an auto repair shop right whether they're at the barber shop right like whether they're like chefs at like the bummy place that i go to and many of them are better storytellers than i am and they value narrative and the value of narrative can be seen in so many different places so to get to be able to spend time to do that, right? Like you get to spend days, you get to spend years doing that is just a big gift in any capacity. I have a friend here in Atlanta, Trudy Nan Boyce. She is a former homicide detective and now a novelist. She writes crime novels. She is also the nosiest person. When you think she's standing at the fish counter, she's actually eavesdropping on the conversations going on. Is that you too? Like she loves nothing more than people watching, which of course helped her as a police officer and just picking up on dialogue. Is that you? People are just so interesting. You yes, know? they are. People, people are interesting. You know, I, I mean, I think when, <laughs> perhaps less so lately because we all sort of been siloed into like our individual revolutions. But I mean, like just asking people like how they are you know or like asking people about themselves or asking them like what they're interested in or how they came to arrive at like a certain place in a certain time i mean it's just so interesting i mean especially in a city like houston that is so deeply diverse whether it comes to the ethnicity of its residents whether it comes to the life experience of its residents where it comes to the age or the way of life, just the way of being, and they're finding a way to make it work with a myriad of folks. Like that is just implicitly interesting. So I'm definitely someone who usually has like an ear out. I'm also interested, and I I see that tattoo that's flashing on camera on the right of our screen. Tell me, tell tell viewers what that is. Yeah, so I have a rosemary tattoo. Yeah, I, I, I do have like a rosemary because? <laughs> tattoo. Because it's my favorite word, rosemary. <laughs> your favorite your favorite word? Mm -hmm. Oh, as in a name or as in the herb? Just as a, oh, as the herb itself. Just like the name, I mean, just the word itself. Like it's like a really, I don't know, it just feels like a word that's full of possibility. Right? And it's just the way that it rolls off the tongue and the way in which it's so much itself yeah. you know like i quite like that you know and as someone who cooks at home like someone who values i you know the fatality of things that you can do in the kitchen and the different ways that you can provide comfort 
to the folks around you. Like it's just really important to me. Yeah. What? Well, let me read a couple of comments here. Uh, let's. See. We got to Stacy. Oh, Stacy commented again. She said, "I'm so glad that you had such encouraging teachers and mentors. I am too." Um, oh. Kate Whitman says, I think that having extra time to read would be the best thing, but I'm finding pandemic reading hard. Have you found that? Any great reads recent, recently or best? That's true. Kate is one of the most prolific readers I know, and she's had a hard time in this pandemic for some reason. It's just slowing her down. How have you been coping? Yeah, many thanks, Kate, for your question. I'm in very much the same boat, right? Like it, in the midst of like so much change, both personal, both infrastructural, both just in the ways of, I don't know, the systems around us. It's been really challenging to, you know, sit down and give like a text, like, you know, sort of requisite attention that it demands. So something that I found myself having to do is, you know, just remind myself to be kind to myself, you know, because we're living in history, you know, and to give yourself grace when it comes to the things that I don't know one might think that would have seemed easier you know even nine months ago like let alone a year or two ago but I also think that we're living in a season in this country and a year in a lot of ways in which there are so many great texts that are being written and published whether it is one like Transcendent Kingdom by Yaw Jesse whether it's one like Lester by Raven Milani, whether it's Britt Bennett's most recent novel, whether it's a novel. Those are the like last the... three novels I read. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yes. Cosine, Cosine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they're, no, they're, they're excellent. Yeah, or like uh, Tokyo Atlanta Station by uh, Yu Miri, which actually just won a National Book Award um, yesterday evening. I mean, there are so many great works that are being written right now, but it's felt really heartening to be able to spend time with them and to spend time in each of those worlds, especially in a moment when so many of our world, so many of like our respective worlds have gotten so much smaller, yes. you know, like even if it does take a little bit more time to make our way through those texts, the fact that they're there is really reassuring. All right, we have one time for one more question, and Trista McGlamory asks the perfect question to end on. We've talked about food as memorial tonight. So what is a food memory that has brought you comfort, the one recipe from someone you love that you have to have? Mine is mm. ackee and saltfish, Trista. There's ackee and saltfish. And we, yeah. Brian and I share Jamaican roots. Yes. His mother's yeah. from Kingston. My people are still in Kingston. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I suppose on that tangent, like I was, I was talking uh, for, for elsewhere about like Thanksgiving and like sort of like what Thanksgiving or Friendsgiving or whatever iteration of celebration. Um, Did you say Friendsgiving? Folks. Yeah, yeah, Friendsgiving. Oh, yeah, I've never heard that yeah. before. Like, oh yeah, 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 Friendsgiving. Yeah, Friendsgiving goes up. Yeah, but however, folks are celebrating. You know, the time that they're able to share with one another, the dishes that they value in the midst of that. And for me, it's jerk chicken, you know? And I suppose like the reason why is that like I lived in, or I grew up in a very white neighborhood, but the street itself was deeply diverse and the street alongside us was deeply diverse and my parents' respective revolutions among their friends, they were deeply diverse. So we would have these Thanksgiving dinners at, anyone's house and it's falling from year to year and regardless of whether it was with our filipino friends or our mexican and mexican american friends whether it was with our korean friends whether it was with our nigerian friends there would be a turkey on the table but no one would touch it because the you know centerpiece would be all of the dishes around it whether it was jollof whether it was kimchi fried rice, whether it was kalti jam, whether it was pancit. And year to year, my mom would make jerk chicken. You know, like she'd come up with the seasoning herself. You know, she'd prepare the chickens herself. She'd allow them to marinate in anticipation of the day. And it feels like a dish that's really integral to this particular season for me. And it certainly 
one that you know I just like hold really dear because it's one in which there's a certain amount of care you have to take in order to do it well. And there's a certain amount of thought that you have to take in order to do it well. And that care and that thought is toward providing comfort to the folks that you're sharing the meal with, or whether it's for yourself and providing comfort for yourself. So it's a dish that's really important to me. Mm -hmm. Well, if you come across the perfect jerk turkey recipe so that turkey doesn't taste like dust anymore, I look forward to reading about that in the New Yorker. <laughs> if I could find it, like I'll, yes. it, it'll be there. Yeah. Brian, thank you so much for granting us your time. Congratulations on the publication of your novel. Um, I mean, when I heard that it was on President Obama, well, that lot, your first novel, was on his top you know, summer reading list, I thought, wow, it does not get any better. So I wish you continued blessings and a very, very happy Thanksgiving. Thank you so much for having me, Gail. I so appreciate it. All right. Bye. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you all. Thank you all for taking the time with us. Yeah. Yes. <laughs>